I'd like to just welcome everyone to Citizens Climate University tonight. It's a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobbies that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities on topics relating to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brett Cease, and tonight's topics, as you can see, is broadening support with veterans and national security audiences. So hopefully tonight you've wanted to create local events that reach a target audience different than perhaps the makeup of your local group tonight, and you're in luck because we're gonna do just that. A webinar that's gonna highlight the work that CCL has been doing across the Southeast and the larger work going on throughout the country, screening both the burden and tide water to attract veterans for discussions on climate and energy to help broaden the diversity of our local chapters. And to help us accomplish that tonight, we have three esteemed guests. So please allow me to introduce each of them. We'll have General Devereaux, a retired Major General and former Director of Operational Planning, Policy, and Strategy for the U.S. Air Force. Rick is a member of the Advisory Board of the Center for Climate and National Security and helped plan and execute a successful showing of the burden sponsored by his local Asheville, North Carolina chapter for CCL. Sean Collins. Sean was a captain in the U.S. Army before co-founding Revive Energy in Nashville, Tennessee. He's been a member of CCL for the past year and has also been managing the Southeast Veterans Tour for the past six months. And lastly, we have the wonderful Roger Sorkin, the executive director of the American Resilience Project and the director of films, including Tidewater and The Burden. Roger is a fellow with the Truman National Security Project, where he also serves as a surrogate speaker for their Operation Free campaign. And if we've done our job right, at the end of this hour, you should be walking away with three goals, one of which is just understanding the four key considerations that help in planning a successfully focused recruiting event in general. It doesn't just even have to be with veterans tonight. The other one is focusing on an initial a plan for recruitment that you can use with your own community. We'll be developing that side by side. And then lastly, we'll have the chance to interact with three experts within the realm of planning and executing climate events focused on veterans and national security audiences. So with that, I'm just gonna provide a quick review of the actual agenda. It's gonna be pretty straightforward. We'll first start with reviewing what's appropriate content and then dive into how to do more focused recruitment, emphasizing location, as well as how to conduct wonderful follow-up. And then we'll have a robust Q&A discussion with a partner reflection activity at the very end. So what I'd love to do is just first off, start by inviting everyone to grab a piece of paper, or if you are so motivated, we actually have a little note sheet that you can follow along tonight with. It's just cclusa.org forward slash ccu dash veterans dash notes. And what we'd like you to do throughout the training is just think about an event that you and your local group might host to attract a unique audience and start really taking notes that capture your attention and also great ideas that you think you can apply to your own community. I'll also say that a lot of this tonight is highlighted in our hostess screening module on community, and I put the link to that in the chat window as well. So I'll get out of the way after one last slide for context, and that is just saying this. Again, tonight's audience is specifically focused on veterans, but I'd like to invite everyone listening in to think about what brings people together overall, any kind of audience and the why of why we do this kind of outreach. Well, intentionally, what we're trying to do with these types of events is diversify CCL's membership and bring in people and do things that we haven't done before, people that we haven't perhaps interacted with or might not feel in our full comfort zone having a chance to strike up a conversation with immediately or have really gotten in the door before in any kind of climate advocacy. And so I know that the current national focus for CCL is diversifying on three types of audiences, conservatives, people of color, and young adults. And what I'd love to really ask everyone listening in is what type of diversity would help your chapter? Again, we're gonna be focusing on veterans tonight, but what additional voices could help you build your group and connect with your members of Congress? That's really the whole key of this webinar. 
So without further ado, I am going to pass the baton. And again, just thank you so much for being on the line again tonight. Sit back and relax, and it's going to be a wonderful show. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us uh, today. Rick Devereaux here. And as uh, Brett mentioned, uh, I was involved in hosting a pretty successful uh, showing of the bird in, in Asheville, North Carolina, a couple years ago. And, you know, our, in our uh, approach that evening when we showed the film, our target group was veterans. Now, why veterans? Uh, well, as Brett mentioned, uh, one of CCL's strengths is bringing uh, people together from disparate groups to sort of engage in this conversation about climate. And uh, people that are interested in national security or veterans aren't typically the same folks that talk about climate and climate change. So this is an opportunity to bring groups together. Uh, you know, veterans are not a monolithic group as this uh, slide suggests, it's a diverse group. So don't fall into the trap of thinking that if you bring in one veteran, you're gonna bring in, you know, hundreds or more because they have different opinions and different perspectives. But what they do have is credibility. Uh, they lean conservative. Uh, they're an important voice, as the slide suggests. Uh, people listen to veterans. When it comes to national security or topics about uh, threats to our nation, a veteran's voice is listened to. So it's a great, great audience to target. Um, I, one of my favorite uh, quotes on this comes from uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, who said, uh, the more you retired generals and admirals speak about the national security implications of climate change, the easier it is for a Republican like me to get involved. So in other words, uh, when, when folks hear folks in uniform uh, talk about climate change and its implications, they listen and pay attention. It, it's kind of a positive dog whistle, if you will. Uh, and, I, and when you think about events uh, targeting veterans, don't limit the target just to veterans. Think about uh, others like folks interested in national security, foreign policy, uh, people with conservative leanings, because uh, for these events to be successful, I think uh, you want a nice, diverse, uh, uh, healthy cross-section. Uh, so so you, we're not looking for homogenous, veteran-only events, but truly uh, diverse and engaging kind of groups. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rick. And one other thing I forgot to mention as we're transitioning to inviting you to think about your first prompt is that you might recognize his charming voice. He was our speaker for CCL's national call last November, I believe, for Veterans Day. Isn't that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So we're happy to have you back on as one of our most uh, highly rated speakers. So I'll just share this. Again, we're going to take a little pause between each of these sections to invite you as the audience to think about who you're interested in. And what I'd like to do this first question is just ask you to think about a target audience that you'd be interested in trying to attract to your event. Who is it? Write it down. Think about it. and We'll come back to it. And what we'll do next is just really get a background again for what these films are that we're going to be talking about tonight. And who better to tell us about the power, the impact, and the creative history behind the burden and Tidewater than their very creator. I'll pass it to you, Roger. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, so yes, um, I uh, produced first the burden. I, I came upon uh, this is gonna, I'm gonna get a little wonky here on you, but I, I learned about the Quadrennial Defense Review in 2010. And at the time I was highly frustrated, like many of you probably were and are still to some degree, uh, at the way some issues, even though they are clearly scientific in nature, um, tend to get highly politicized depending upon who's presenting the data. And with all due respect, I, you know, all due respect to Al Gore, I think uh, the fatal mistake in the climate movement was rallying around someone who is such a political animal. Never mind what his views are. Anybody, any pol political figure can polarize. Uh, you know, you see it no matter what, what party letter comes after your name. 
Um, and I think the beautiful thing about the military is that, that of all of our government agencies, at least so far, uh, the military is associated with being apolitical. And as the general can tell you and anyone who has served, um, politics is not just inappropriate for the military, it's dangerous. Um, you don't want life and death decisions being made based on political ideologies. Uh, you gotta look at the facts. Um, and so that's what, really what I set out on. When I, when, so coming back to the quadrennial defense review, there was a phrase in there that called climate change a threat multiplier. And we've heard that term a lot nowadays, but um, it was sort of fresh and new, I thought in 2010. And it, it, it occurred to me that that's, that's the way into this conversation. We're not talking about polar bears. Uh, we don't wanna push all the same buttons that, that tend to get pushed in these discussions. Uh, well, oh, you, don't, you, you must hate the earth, so therefore, uh, you know, you must be a Republican, or you're a Democrat, you don't care about jobs. I mean, these, these arguments got so reduced to, to nonsense. Um, you know, either you're for the environment or you're for the economy was, a, was sort of this trope for a while. And I think it's clear to a lot of people that, that our economic health, our energy, uh, our environmental health, all of these things are so intertwined. And of course, they all go to our national security. Uh, and so national security traditionally has always been uh, a, more of a unifying factor uh, than most other issues uh, in, our, in our civic life. Uh, so I thought it would be a good place to engage people who had been skeptical simply because poor old Al Gore was the, <laughs> was the poster child for, for climate change. Um, and so to, to take it out of the political realm and put it into the realm of selfless sacrifice honor, you know, all of those great qualities that, that we associate with military service. Um, I thought that that was the way to go. And, and, and not to do it in a way that's pandering, um, but really just to, to present the facts. Um, you know, it's all about blood and treasure. Any military leader will tell you that, that force protection is at the heart of every decision that they make. Um, and, and certainly the, the higher up you go in the, the chain, uh, the more you're responsible for making sure tax dollars are spent properly uh, through your, your commands. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it seemed like a no brainer to me. It, it's still surprising to me that, you know, eight years later, uh, people still will come up to me and say, wow, I never thought about it like that. And I, I don't feel responsible for that. I, I would blame the, the wider media for not making that more of a, uh, an issue. Um, but, uh, anyhow, the, the burden looked at how the military, uh, was embracing renewable energy. Um, again, for the reasons that I stated, not because there's some sort of sentimental uh, caring for Mother Earth. Uh, if it didn't have anything to do with fighting and winning the nation's wars, it wasn't going to be on the, the table for the military. Um, and so I thought that was a great way into the conversation. And that led to the next film called Tidewater, which looks at how sea level rise uh, affects national security, specifically in the Hampton Roads region, where we have our largest concentration of military bases or installations in the, in the United States, including our largest naval base. Um, and uh, you know, there are real life examples of sailors who just can't get to work sometimes because it's flooding. Um, and in many cases, those sailors are not from um, coastal areas. They come from the interior of the country and they, they don't know what to do with this. They've never seen anything like that before. So uh, again, another way into the conversation um, first one is more on energy, the second is more on environment, but both have a tremendous impact on national security. Thank you so much, Roger, for giving us a little bit of the vision behind what the origin for both of those fantastic movies were. And we'll just take a quick pause. Again, the uh, link to find out more about both of these and how you can screen it is in the chat as well. And for the second step along our journey tonight, think about, as Roger shared the content behind the burden in Tidewater, what content is it for you that would attract your target audience? And again, take a moment, think about what that might look like and how you could create that in your own community or bring that in with films like what we're discussing tonight. And we'll move on as you think about that to talk about a critical element that Sean's gonna highlight on focus recruitment. And I guess I think first it's uh, Rick, my apologies. Okay, uh, well, yeah, now, now we've, uh, Roger has led us through a discussion of the content, the genesis of the content. The good news is the content for your event is excellent. Uh, but the problem is if you build it, they won't necessarily come. And my, if, if my big takeaway, hopefully for you this evening is 
marketing has to be your main effort. 80% of your effort, I would estimate, needs to go into marketing your event. 20% in actually executing or planning the event itself, but it's all about getting the people to come out. And remember, energy or, uh, effort doesn't count. You don't get an A for effort. It's all about results and being effective with your, your marketing. So really think that through. How do you get the folks that you want to come out? And one of the key facets of that is getting these trusted messengers. In other words, if you're going to target veterans, getting a veteran in your group that is well connected to the veteran community, that's credible, and that has a passion for the national security implications of climate change. If you've got that person and they're committed, you're halfway there. But it's really, really important to identify one or two folks like that right up front. And then go out to the veterans groups, go to the uh, Veterans Council. Uh, when we promoted our event, event in Asheville, uh, it was myself and our CCL chapter leader, Steffi Rausch, and it was this retired general with, uh, I hope Steffi wouldn't be offended, but a hippie chick who uh, was very passionate about CCL. And the veterans group looked at us and they go, we don't know what to make of these two, but we were interested. They got our attention. We showed uh, the burden trailer. And in the trailer, these veterans don't see talking think tank heads, but they see real veterans, people in uniform, people at the Pentagon. And they're like, okay, you got my attention. I want to come to your event. So it's about getting out there with a lot of shoe leather, talking to the veterans group. And, and don't be afraid to stir up a little controversy in your marketing. Say that this is not going to be your standard climate change event. We're gonna look at this event through a different lens. We're gonna bring disparate groups together. We're gonna to look at climate change in a way that you've never looked at it before. Get out there. I remember when we promoted our event, we got on a conservative uh, radio talk show and uh, I got in a bit of a dialogue with the uh, talk show host and he said, well, I know you're just trying to get veterans to come out uh, for really an environmental pitch. And as soon as they show up, you'll roll out your Trojan horse and the tree huggers will jump out, you know, and accost them. And uh, I said, well, uh, I understand that perspective, but we get the same criticism from the far left that we're gonna use veterans to somehow promote uh, environmental stewardship when everyone knows that the military is the worst offender when it comes to the environment. So stir up a little uh, controversy, a little bit of action, and that will help uh, get a good turnout. And be sure to uh, really leverage people's personal networks. You know, flyers, emails, social media, all that, is good, but there's no substitute for personal appeals to people that have their own groups, their own networks, things like rotary clubs or uh, veteran groups or uh, uh, other kind of uh, networks. Uh, you know, one, one final little anecdote on this slide is, uh, and, and it gets to the last bullet, the importance of not reverting to inviting only your standard audience. At our event, we had sort of the traditional climate change crowd with veterans, with uh, a group from a local World Affairs Council who was interested in foreign policy. And one of the veterans came up to me afterwards and said, you know, tonight I had my first meaningful conversation with an environmentalist. And you know, they're not half bad. They're not half bad. So it's this idea of engagement and dialogue. And but I'll, I'll tell you, I, I can't foot stop the foot stomp the marketing aspect enough. And then I think some important notes, uh, you know, it, it obviously be best if that champion you had and the veteran was in your chapter, but they don't have to be. Uh, I know a lot of CCL chapters out there are young and don't have veteran presence. Um, but if you can get someone influential in the area, 
to, to just make some connections and, and refer people to it and, and push them to go, that's still huge. Um, and then think about what would draw you to watch a movie on a topic you right now don't care about. Um, so it's, it's not going to be just the fact there's a movie for free or for five bucks. You need to have a strong panel that has some street credibility and is going to draw people in. And you need to be able to frame the message in your recruiting um, towards the audience you're recruiting towards. You don't have to have just one pitch. If you're going to a veterans group, it's about veterans issues. If you're going to a business council or the, you know, um, something like that, then you use an economy um, perspective. Um, and so you just got to shape it towards who you're, you're trying to get there. Yeah. Uh, if I can just jump in, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think uh, having a localized call to action is critical. And even if that action is just simply uh, talk to your crazy uncle at Thanksgiving, that's a call to action. Um, you know, it, every, every place is different. Um, sometimes it's some, some kind of political action that's required uh, in the moment. There's a bond measure people are voting on and you want them to take that kind of action. Or you just simply want them to, to write letters. I mean, it could be anything, but uh, I, I'd always recommend figuring out what that call to action is first. And then that helps you figure out who should be on your panel and then what, what needs to be uh, talked about uh, in the Q&A which is a really critical part of the, the event. Excellent, thank you all three. One quick pause moment here is just thinking about your own recruitment strategy. Who is it that you want to bring in with your target audience and how can you use the recommendations that all three of our panelists have shared about recruiting people to attend and being strategic about how you're engaging them and really leveraging the power of local media as well as Facebook. I know that was the post that we shared just on that last slide about one of the local events and really having that social proofing. Think about what that looks like for you. And as you transition into doing that, let's talk about where you're actually going to hold the place. Uh, what's the place that you're going to hold the event rather? I know both of you have wonderful examples from your own experiences. Okay, yeah. As, as they say in real estate, location, location, location. Yeah, where you hold your event really does matter. It sends a signal. Um, you know, we actually had two showings of the burden in Asheville. The first was a somewhat of a failed attempt, and we did it at a sort of local movie theater complex. It was associated with sort of the, the green crowd, um, kind of artsy movies located right downtown. We had a small showing, mostly preaching to the choir uh, for that event. But the second time around, we targeted a brewery. And it wasn't a brewery downtown. It was a brewery a little bit on the outskirts, had more of a blue collar crowd and feel to it. Um, and uh, it, so it was sort of a neutral venue, a, a venue that anybody from any walk of life would be feel comfortable walking into. So it felt like more of a home game than a, an away game for a veteran. And I think breweries are, are sort of a, a nice uh, place if you, can, if you can find one, you know, a little uh, lubrication for the evening and the discussion is helpful. And besides the, the location itself, uh, think about how you will facilitate mingle time before and after your event, because as Roger said, this is when the calls to action can really start to be formulated if people have time to talk and chat and they feel comfortable in the location. So just to give some examples of, of where we've been successful and where we've kind of missed the boat, um, we've got one coming up uh, in, in Virginia. We'll be at Vincent Hall, which is uh, a community for, for veterans only. So every resident there is a vet and they are obviously very connected as an organization to the veteran, to all sorts of veteran groups and conservative groups. Um, and they have all sorts of events that are regularly attended, as you would expect, by veterans. Um, so by getting the showing there, we're instantly plugged into a huge network um, and it's being you know, marketed by Vincent Hall. So it's not, it's not some random CCL or making calls. It's the Vincent Hall staff saying, hey, we're having this event. Um, and so can't, can't guarantee that that will go great, but I'm, I'm very confident. Um, and then the flip side of that is, um, you know, we used, we used that brewery methodology kind of as our, our game plan for the whole tour. Um, and, and I actually put one together in Clarksville 
Um, and, and the best location I thought was uh, a distillery in town. Um, it was a little outside of town. There was going to be no foot traffic. Um, and there was really no reason for anyone to drive by there uh, unless they were actually going to the event. And so that one was one of our lower showing events um, just because there wasn't, there, people don't go and just hang out at a distillery in Clarksville, Tennessee. There weren't people walking by to see something going on. Um, and so we were really relying on the marketing we had done before that. So I think it's just knowing, knowing the area you're in and where people, people are going to hang out and feel comfortable being. And so if you have that connection to the group, um, you know, so if you have that veteran who's already kind of plugged in, they can be kind of a guide for you. Um, whereas if you're going you know, in Clarksville, Tennessee, where we didn't actually have, have somebody on the planning team there, um, we're kind of just guessing. So I think you just got to leverage your connections and, and make the right call in the city you're in and the town you're in. And I'll just throw this quick question out there for all three of you, I guess, one of which uh, is, what would you recommend as far as putting together a panel? I've heard that you've mentioned, you know, panels help draw or supplement the movie. And also, how do you properly recognize service uh, for those that do come and attend as veterans during the event? How, how can you really honor their service, whether active or, uh, you know, retired as part of the event? So I, as far as recognizing people, if you're, if the, venue's going to charge admission the easy answer is give veterans free admission that's something that that rick suggested to me and we're trying to implement now going forward um and then in terms of building the panel the the paradigm we've been looking at has been one sort of veteran or someone connected to the the military and you know the defense one kind of local influencer and then someone from ccl and we've we've shifted from that a little bit based on the event but I think that's a smart methodology. A lot of people, um, so I, I think the, the big names we've done, we did the mayor for Clarksville um, and an exit poll showed that half the people there were there just to hear the mayor speak. Um, you know, I think that the one that General Devereaux did that was very successful, the majority of people were there because they wanted to hear General Devereaux speak. Um, I think that those are, are pretty key draws. It, there's not much credibility behind having Sean Collins, uh, an army captain who got out you know, come and speak. No one really cares what I have to say. Um, so you got to think about, again, you're asking people to come and, and spend two hours of their time on a topic that right now they don't care about what's going to bring them in. Yeah. You know, I just add, I, I think the panel uh, can be fluid, but having uh, at least one veteran with some credibility in the sort of national security field and the topic is helpful and a CCL person, of course, as people interested in the solution side of the equation. And then that, that third one is kind of a wild card, I think, you know, maybe it, like Sean says, a local draw, maybe an academic, um, maybe just somebody that is interested in bringing groups together, you know, that has a reputation as uh, kind of a, 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 someone that bridges gaps in the community. And, and offering free admission for veterans, I think is really a good, veterans love free stuff. They're used to getting the military discount and so forth. So it's a nice way to say thank you up front. And there's, it, it can't be uh, overstated how important food and drinks are sometimes. So you give anybody free food and drink, uh, you're, I think you have something like an 80% chance uh, in, increase that they're gonna attend. Uh, but going back to something that General Devereaux said earlier uh, regarding Lindsey Graham, um, go for a Republican, get a high profile Republican. I mean, it, it is the way into the conversation. That, that's, that's one of the main reasons why I, I made these films. It's, I, I sort of operate under the, so it's a sort of a cynical term, but internally I, I go with the idea of political cover. We're trying to pol provide political cover to politicians who are generally smart people, um, are very calculating people and understand the power of a photo op. And just by standing up on a stage with, you know, they, Lindsey Graham does not want to get on a stage with Al Gore. He won't do it. You give him all the free food in the world, he's not going to come. Um, they all, you know, and this is kind of cynical too, um, but they all want to be photographed next to a, a flag officer too. Um, and again, not to at all condone the idea of, you know, trotting out your uh, you know, your, your 
soldiers with all of their their medals to to do the photo op i'm not a not a big supporter of that i think it's um if the intentions are pure it it works but a lot of the time it's uh you're you're operating with people who do that on I mean, I'm, th I'm thinking of uh, you know political hacks who are trying to get somebody elected that, that that's what they're going to do oh we'll, we'll get a photo op with the general so i think you know high profile is a key here uh, and then what that also enables you to do is it enables you to to drive the conversation after the event. So what we always try to do at our screenings, and, and we actually formed our own organization, uh, we, we certainly don't have the muscle and the reach of CCL, and we don't aspire to have that. Uh, so we're really grateful that CCL has this network and is able to do these webinars. But one thing we try to do is we try to attract media attention to some of these events. And uh, the higher profile person you have, the more likely you're gonna have media attention. So if you can get your uh, you know, the representative of the district in which you're in, whether that's at the state level um, or the national level, uh, that goes a long way because then if you can get media coverage, then not only did you have people come out that night, uh, but then you have a, an article that's written the next day that then gets retweeted. So, you know, just think about trying to keep that ball up in the air as much as you can. Um, and, and certainly high profile individuals will, uh, will, will ensure that uh, it's more likely. Absolutely. No, I think that all of you combined to just share some really powerful advice that was field tested and not just the standard roll out your CCL banner and sign up sheet and make sure to have a you know powerful call to action, uh, but really how to personalize it. And I, I really love that uh, home field rather than the away field metaphor as well, General Devereaux. So thanks for all of those examples. And what we'll just ask people listening in now is thinking about what location would work for your target audience. What would that look like? What would make them comfortable? What would bring them in? And keeping in mind all the advice that we've heard, continue to take notes down and personalizing it to your own community. And I'll just say this really quickly. So if you're like me and you know, hearing all this information feels intimidating at times because it's a lot, one thing that we're also debuting tonight is a little template for a organizer, a, uh, if you will, a Google Sheet that's gonna be helping you, if you're interested, uh, have a template to put everything all together and manage and delegate roles. And so I'll put that in the chat window here as well. And if you're listening in, it'll be in the additional links section of the webinar. Uh, but this CCL Outreach Event Planner is essentially just a helpful way that we have built out um, a systemized single document that can be shared across the event organizers and track who's doing what from the actual roles to who's contacted who in terms of local media or hang up flyers, who's invited the local politicians, what your speakers are doing or who's confirmed their headshot, you name it, it's all there in one spot. But I will say also this, that it's important if you do share this to make sure that it's only shared with the people that you are going to be organizing with because just for privacy considerations, we wanna make sure that this information isn't getting out there, it isn't available uh, public, it isn't viewable beyond those that you're going to be viewing it at. So if you have questions about how to set it up in your Google Sheets, just let me know and we do wanna put a plug in for privacy as well as highlighting this helpful organizer. So with that, we've gone through the first half and let's pivot to the, uh, the bottom half of the hour here and focus on the other most important half. I'll pass it back to you, Sean, to talk about follow-up. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, before the event, it's marketing is really the, the biggest thing that matters. And then uh, the flip side is the follow up is, is probably the part that's actually going to pay the dividends because um, no one is going to go and see this movie and then immediately know what to do and how to take action. Um, and so the whole point is that you're, you're starting a conversation with these people. We're trying to reframe the way that this issue is being seen. Um, and so you have to take them to, to being a climate warrior, right? So, um, no one wants to get a mass email. People want to feel like they matter and they belong to a group and they're going to have impact and influence. So you need to see some sort of personal follow-up. So if it's a huge audience of, or if you had a, a really successful event with tons of people signing up, maybe you have a whole team of people that each do five or six follow-ups. If you've only get a few signups, then it can be one person, but really within three days, you need to have some sort of personal follow-up. Um, try and learn about them and their motivations and interests and, and figure out how you can use this person and build their interest and involvement. 
Um, and then you want to give them a, a small task because that's what gets people to be bought in is that they need to, they need to invest their something of their own. They've already given you time by going to the event, maybe money if they bought a ticket. Um, and now you need to start ramping it up. So you need to give them a very specific task or project. Um, so they can contribute. There's, they can see results from whatever they did. They know that what they did made an impact. It gets them involved in the group. Um, and then slowly you want to keep kind of ramping up the projects you're giving them until they are, you know, trying to start a new chapter somewhere, but, but you need, you need to ramp them up and you need to have that first one be something where there's tangible results they can see. So two other quick notes. Once you get the signups, get the, get those names into Salesforce. So they're getting the, the CCL um, newsletters. So if you don't have Salesforce access, get it to your group leader who can get it to the regional coordinator, whatever. But, but a, a name on your list is great, but a name on the CCL list provides a whole bunch of resources to get them. Um, and then as you look at ex examples of tasks, um, you know, uh, showing a movie showing doesn't have to be the end of it. So you could do multiple events or tabling events and you like uh, scheduling and planning a movie event is a great task. You can say, Hey, we need you to call these five veterans groups. Um, we want you to work the table for, for one hour this week. Um, can you give us a list of, you know, three, three businesses that might be interested in doing a corporate support letter? Um, you know, whatever it is, some, just something very simple. It doesn't have to be anything big, but something that does take some time and shows um, results and, and ideally gets them working with other CCL members so they feel like they're part of the community and part of the team. So steps five and six, just really focusing in, this is the last little prompt we'll provide, but what follow-up plans make sense for your event? And what help do you want to start thinking about ahead of time in bringing others throughout your community to prepare for the event as well as prepare for that follow-up so you can be strategic and make sure that the ball isn't dropped. Hosting partners um, uh, is important because I think uh, by getting uh, a particular group or two to join with you, uh, it kind of brings in other groups after they follow in after that. You know, one of the things we did is we made this pitch to the local a county veterans council. And the nice thing about that is that all the veterans group are represented in one forum. So you got them all there together. And uh, what we actually did is uh, convince them to have their monthly meeting uh, before the showing of the burden. So, uh, you know, we, we uh, offered to buy their beer <laughs> for their meeting and so forth. And uh, that worked out uh, really nicely. Uh, but there's other groups that you can pitch this to, things like the Military Officers Association of America, or their acronym, acronym is MOAA, M-O-A-A, a World Affairs Council. I mentioned Rotary Clubs uh, and uh, uh, retiree groups uh, are, are also uh, American Legion, uh, Disabled American Veterans, uh, VFW. I noticed that chat, one of the chat questions had to do with uh, Veterans for Peace. Veterans for Peace, uh, this is kind of a, uh, that could be an entry point for you, but I would be careful of making Veterans for Peace your sort of headliner partner group because other veterans group could feel a little bit alienated uh, from them, but I'll let the others uh, chime in. Yeah, I think Veterans for Peace is a great organization you definitely want to bring in, but they can be invited to your standard events. Um, if you're doing conservative outreach and, and regular veterans outreach, they are not the group that is going to be your in. Um, and in fact, if, if, you, if you bring them to a VFW or to a Team Red, White, and Blue meeting or something like that, that'll probably be one of the, the ends of the conversation. Oh, you know, one other thing I'll throw in there is... Uh some folks will have active duty military installations uh, near their chapter. Um, I would lower your expectations in terms of getting active duty partners, uh, uh, local installation commanders or local base officials. Uh, they're gonna shy away from this kind of event because of the inherent politicization of uh, climate change topic 
they'll be leery. Doesn't mean that they won't show. And in some cases, if you're, if you're, uh, you may be able to attract someone to your panel, especially if it's a, a fact-based conversation on, you know, sort of a sea level rise and how it might be affecting uh, directly a coastal installation. But I would lower your expectations when it comes to active duty personnel being involved. Yeah, and there was a, a question someone had just asked about uh, approaching the base press office. I, I would, in fact, start there. If, if you would like to try to bring someone in active duty, certainly start with the PAO. Um, and as the general said, it's fact-based. You, can, you can't stress that enough. Uh, if you lead with climate change, uh, you get relegated to, uh, you know, the dustbin over there. Um, but, you know, what we, so we had a, a commanding officer at Naval Station Norfolk come out in uniform to our screening of Tidewater uh, during the current administration. Uh, he's in the film, so that made it easier, uh, but he wasn't there to talk about climate change. He was barely even there to talk about sea level rise. He was talking about the resilience of the bases against storms. Um, and that's a great conversation to have. The solutions to making the base more resilient against storms is directly related to how we respond to climate change. Uh, so if they want to call it something with a lot of jargon and call it an infrastructure project, that's great. Um, so you might lead with that. Um, just be very aware of the, the political uh, buttons that can be pushed and uh, stay away from those. Sound boring. You should sound boring when you make your request to the PAO. Yeah, understand that, you know, if, if you make it sound political, it could be, you know, it sounds like something they're risking their career to speak at. Um, but if you emphasize that it's something that they are doing, like in Georgia, there are quite a few solar projects on, on military bases. If you emphasize, hey, we want to talk about all the great things you're doing as a leader to, to build, build resilience and build and improve operational readiness, suddenly it's actually a good note for not only them, but the base, the army. Um, and it's not, it's not political. It's just explaining the steps that they're taking to make themselves ready. Yeah, and you know, there, the uh, Truman National Security Project has a great primer on, uh, I think it's called the Military 101 webinar or something like that, where it's basically a slideshow and it just sort of gives you some, you know, if you haven't served in the military and you don't, you don't really uh, know the language, I certainly was on a steep learning curve a few years ago. Uh, this is a really good way to understand, uh, you know, like you don't want to call up an Air Force base and say that you want soldiers to appear. Um, you know, there's lots of really basic things that, that you can do to make yourself sound credible that are easy. Uh, so I would encourage you to just become familiar with some, some kind of military speak and jargon um, and really just put yourself in their shoes. You know, if you're a press officer uh, for, um, you know, Navy captain, um, they're just looking out for two things, their own job and their, and their boss. And uh, nothing you can say is going to going to persuade them otherwise unless it absolutely aligns with the task that they're trying to perform uh, that's been given to them by their chain of command. So the more you can research that and go into the Georgia example, um, in our new film, we're, we profile the army specifically because they put a th 30 megawatts on three different army bases and they worked with Georgia Power, the, the utility company there. Uh, and the Public Service Commission in Georgia, they all, they all teamed up. I mean, it really was this great uh, coming together of, of, of large, otherwise bureaucratic uh, and gridlock prone entities uh, that really got a lot done in short time for the right reasons. And, you know, we got current uh, DOD officials on camera for it under this current administration. Uh, and again, we didn't talk about climate change, but we talked about how they are able to train better because they don't have interruptions of power on their basis. And that, that was the nature of the conversation and they were, they were happy to talk about it in those terms. And frankly, a lot of people in DOD, they are, they're looking for ways to talk about this. Um, but you have to present it the right way in order for them to, to come on board. Yeah, I, I think that can't be emphasized enough. I mean, if, if you take away one word from this, this discussion, it's the word resilience. Uh, that is the buzzword in the military today when it comes to these topics, how to make our military more resilient, how to make them more operationally effective, how to reduce vulnerabilities, how to make uh, our military more effective at war fighting. 
that should be the focus. Uh, and, uh, you know, military really isn't interested in saving the planet, not even interested in entering the debate on human versus natural climate change, but they want to be better. They want to fight better and resiliency is, is, uh, is the way to get there. And, and one other point about that is, you know, we get a lot of humanitarian effort coming from the military and increasingly so as, as we see the, I mean, if, if you're, if you call up and you say you want to, you want to talk about how the military is so vital as a first responder in our community, S stop there. Don't say because climate change is increasing the frequency of storms. Uh, you don't have to add that extra phrase in there. So that's actually the, another focus in this uh, new film. Um, why does the base have to have uninterrupted power? Well, because A, they're training, and B, they're going to take care of all the rest of us uh, when the roads are flooded and, and meals need to be distributed for a few days. Um, so, I, and that's a story that every, everyone in uniform and out of uniform is eager to tell. Um, it's, a, it's a really underappreciated uh, service for the military. I mean, uh, I'll let the general explain why that's relevant to our national security, but uh, you know, it's, it's something that we do around the world and we do it here and uh, you know, we really are being more stretched even more thin because of the increased frequency of uh, natural disasters. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, most uh, veterans, when they really look at their careers in hindsight, and they add up all the humanitarian assistance and disaster response operations, uh, even in this time of conflict that we're, we're still in, they'll point to those operations oftentimes as being more numerous, uh, more involved than their combat experience. Uh, so that's something that really resonates. And as Roger says, uh, you don't have to, you know, let, let the audience draw their own conclusion about those testimonials regarding activities and effort in providing that kind of response. They'll draw, they'll draw their own conclusions about whether the climate is changing and that's taxing the military to a, a higher level. Thank you so much, Roger, Sean, and General Devereaux for all of these insights. And I'll just quickly go through this slide and feel free to add anything else that you'd like to. And then we have one last little teaser here. So this can just be a quick minute highlighting that we are aware that tonight was talking about veteran and national security audiences. If you are also interested in thinking about what other audiences might attract more conservatives and who else to focus on, we have recommendations in the slide notes here tonight about really focusing with business groups. For example, the most recent uh, US business case for carbon tax form that happened at the Global Climate Action Summit and featured some of the most well-known corporate leaders in the country. Uh, that'd be a wonderful event. Uh, if you're looking at rural focused events or outdoor sports uh, oriented and winter industry sports, we have wonderful screenings on those as well. We also have a very vibrant action team the Ski and Outdoor Industry Action Team that I'll put a link to in the chat window as well that's done outreach that has built supporters and endorsements from not only ski areas, but snow, snowmobiler associations, skiers, scuba divers, birding, fishing, you name it. It really all depends on that location. And so I'll just uh, emphasize that there's many other ways to draw and broaden that coalition and really appreciate zoning in tonight on this particular topic. Looking back on the past six months of this project, if you, if you shift the thought actually from how do I attract audiences to where do I go that audiences already are, you're gonna spend so much time trying to get anybody in the room. Why not try and take advantage of having a partner? A, a lot of groups struggle to figure out what material to do for their monthly events. We have material. So package it in a way that allows you to get in front of them and I, already receptive and already gathered group. So, I mean, again, remember how you're gonna to have to frame it properly and you're gonna to have to, to package that because it's not necessarily something that they are actively interested in. Um, but that's how, that's a, that'd be a way to get an audience. Yeah, so I mentioned it a little bit, uh, the new film, it's actually a film series on the future of the grid, on transforming the electric grid. And the reason why it's a series, I have a couple of reasons. It allows us to keep the conversation going um, beyond just one film, although 
I, I'm, I'm heartened to see that, you know, several years after other films have come out, we're still talking about them. So that's, that's encouraging. Um, but the grid, uh, when you talk about transforming the grid, it, it's sort of foolish to think that you could just tell that story in one 40 minute film. Uh, it is a moving target like no other. Uh, with lots of developments and lots of aspects, um, so many stakeholders. And so we're really trying to look at as many aspects of it as we can. The, the first film in this series just premiered last week at the Global Climate Action Summit. And it's sort of like a, think of it as a, a table of contents on really what this narrative will look like. Um, it kind of a you know strategic narrative is the term that I come back to, and it's a it's not my that's not my term, but it, it comes from a colleague of of, uh, of General Devereaux said um, who's a two strategist for uh, then Joint Chiefs Chairman Admiral Mike Mullen uh, wrote a paper called a New National Strategic Narrative, and it really resonated with me. It's the time I was getting excited about the Quadrennial Defense Review, um, but they talk about the importance of being able to tell a good story. Uh, you know, to have that touchstone that everyone could come back to. So that's what we're trying to do with this narrative. And we're trying to bring together the interests of lots of private sector groups. So the utilities industry, the auto industry, tech, and of course, defense sectors. Uh, they all have a stake in how this grid gets transformed. And they all have a lot to lose if it doesn't get done right, specifically the auto and utilities sectors. Uh, so the focus of this first film is really trying to bring those interests together because um, if we can get them on board, uh, then we might just get the kind of policies uh, and business environment that we need for, uh, for our renewable energy economy to take off. And, you know, again, these are very conservative friendly themes. Um, at no point did I say, you know, we need to have a big government plan for this. Um, we just need to, to kind of create an environment in which there's, there's at least a modicum of trust and people understand that we're all moving in a, in a direction that, that is, is in the name of prosperity, prosperity for all of the, those industries involved. Um, and the reason why auto is in there because you know, clearly electric vehicles are gonna be a big player in all this. And utilities, uh, they're gonna need to modify what they do in order to accommodate those electric vehicles. What we find though, sort of a stumbling block now is that you know, people don't wanna buy electric cars because they, they don't feel confident that there's enough charging infrastructure and uh, the people that would be tasked with putting in that charging infrastructure, such as the utilities and, uh, and government, um, they're hesitant because they don't think people are driving electric cars. So we need to make sure that, uh, you know, we get over this phase where the other person is waiting for the, you know, the one person's waiting for the other one to jump in first. Uh, so that, that's sort of our call to action is, is to bring these folks together to highlight that they, they have common interests. Um, and where national security comes in, as I mentioned earlier, we focused on the military bases and we show what a great model uh, the, the Army, and, and it's not just the Army, I mean, the Air Force and the Marines and the Navy, all in Georgia, are now really jumping into this because they saw that the utility company was ready to go. They had a good model with the Army. Um, and so now uh, the other branches are uh, putting a lot of solar on their bases. Um, and so it's, our, our intention for covering that story was to show that this, this partnership could be then exported as a basic template for other regions in the country. And we'll, as you know, energy policy is really made on a state by state basis. So it's, it's never gonna be a perfect overlay but there are elements of that partnership that can be applied to many other parts of the country, specifically where we have a lot of military installations. Um, so th that's essentially the, uh, the intention of the film um, and the intention of the series. And uh, we're gonna be looking at rebuilding Puerto Rico. We're looking at um, the sociology of energy use, how we as a culture uh, take it for granted, use it. And that's sort of going towards the, the efficiency model um, to try to, you know, an easy call to action. Hey, everybody use less electricity. Tough, tough call for Americans, I know, but, um, you know, one that I think we can, we can put out there. So um, I'll stop there. I mean, there's a lot of other good ideas for, uh, for the story of the future of the grid. And I'm sure as the days go by, the months and, and years go by, we'll, we'll learn of new topics for that. Well, excellent. You definitely left us with a, a wonderful teaser there. And uh, the link again is in the slide deck that you can follow along for after tonight's webinar, as well as the actual chat window. 
And so I, I'm aware that we have about a minute left. So let's still at least be available for one, if not two questions, if all three of our esteemed guests are willing uh, for anyone that's still on the line that hasn't had their uh, questions answered. And I'll just throw out there, I loved hearing your reference to the national strategic narrative, Roger. Uh, I remember back in 2011, one of the co-authors, uh, Colonel Mickleby, was also one of our national speakers. So uh, we at CCL have been a big fan of, of their work, and I'm glad to hear that that was uh, one of your earlier inspirations here as well. So The other, the other co-author uh, was Captain Wayne Porter, who is in the burden. Many of you know who that is. Thank you for that connection. Sean, do you just want to highlight the uh, veteran special Speaking of that, for Congressional Education Day? Yeah, Congressional Education Day will be right after Veterans Day, so the 12th and 13th of, of uh, November. And any military veterans can use the code VETERAN and have the fee completely waived. So if you know anyone in, who's involved in CCL or interested in it, um, who is a military veteran, just, just make sure they know that code so they can get there uh, for free. And that's definitely another way that CCL is trying to really honor the lives and services that have been involved in this specific campaign. So please continue to feel free to reach out and offer that as an important opportunity for us to venerate and lift those voices in our lobby visits in DC. We're very honored again to have all three of our esteemed guests on the line tonight. And if you do have any questions for General Devereaux, for Roger, for Sean, for myself, please feel free to reach out. Sean and I's email is here. We'd love to forward those questions if they are specifically for uh, either General Devereaux or Roger as well. And uh, again, at this point, we're just so grateful for all of you making time tonight. We couldn't do this without you. And all of those that are tuning in later, thank you for your work and your efforts in reaching out and conducting these events and planning these actual outreach opportunities for your own communities. We hope you found tonight's webinar helpful. We look forward to hearing your feedback on what worked and how we can all continue to advance the political will for a livable world. I'll unmute all lines, and again, thank you all for being on the line tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks, bro. Great webinar. Thank you all. Really appreciate it.